It is now sub. It is now seven. We have no. Oh, do we have a speaker? I'm looking at the clock right there, and it says seven o'clock. Then, hey, I want to get a jump start. Two minute warning. All right. By the city council clock, it is now seven o'clock. And I'd like to call this meeting to order. Secretary, please call the roll. Mr. Broll. Present. Mr. Lalonde. Present. Mr. Lubeck. Present. Ms. Moody. Present. Ms. Ulinski here. And Chairman DeHaan. Here. Moving on to approval of the agenda. May I have a motion for the approval of the agenda? Make a motion to approve the agenda of February 2nd, 2023. I have motion. Do we support. have support? We have motion and support. Secretary, please call the roll. Ms. Ulinski, yes. Mr. Lubeck? Yes. Mr. Broll? Yes. Mr. Lalonde? Yes. Ms. Moody? Yes. And Chairman DeHunt? Yes. Next, we'll move into the first hearing of the public. If you have comments on the items that will be during the public hearing, please refrain if you can. Uh, and save those comments for the public hearing. Uh, as the public hearing is an open forum, you are free to say whatever you want. It is just our wish that you refrain from speaking on the public agenda items until we have the public hearing. Does anybody wish to be heard? Does anybody wish to be heard? Seeing none, we'll close the first hearing of the public. Moving on to the approval of the minutes. I make a motion to approve the minutes of January 5th and January 19th with the correction of the year from 2022 to January 5th and January 19th, 2023. We have motion. Do we have support? Support. I'll second. We have motion, support, and a third. Secretary, please call the roll. Ms. Ulinski, yes. Ms. Moody? Yes. Mr. Lalonde? Yes. Mr. Broll? Yes for the first one, abstain for the second. Mr. Lubeck? Yes. And Chairman DeHaan? Yes. Moving on, we'll move into the first public hearing. This would be for the presentation of Holistic Health Project 2 at 21145 Gratiot. Uh, Ms. Brashashevsky, if we, you could give us a little feedback, and then we can open it up. Sure, I will introduce the project for you. We have the applicant in the room. I have been working closely with Mark Schumer. Shamir, okay, Mark's been a great partner within this, this process. So the planning department's reviewed the special land use and site plan application to operate a medical marijuana provisioning center at 21145 Gratiot between Topher and Eight Mile on the west side of Gratiot. The project involves the demolition of the existing building at the project site and the creation of an East Point Memorial and parking lot for veterans and first responders located at the existing parking lot on the parcel directly northwest of the site. The review is based on the December 10th site plan, 2021. And the applicant, again, seeks to demolish the existing building to create a provisioning center in an 18-space parking lot, which includes two electrical charging stations. Other community benefits on the site include a mural along the south building facade and environmentally friendly design, for example, solar panel, solar roof panels, and a white TPO roof to aid reflectivity and energy efficient appliances and design. Landscaping improvements will also be made. The site is made up of two parcels, so they must be combined during the, the future building department application processes. Um, the expected investment on this property is anticipated to be two, around $2 million. So again, the community benefits on this project are the creation of the East Point Memorial Site for first responders and veterans. And then also they will adopt flower beds and parks for hands-on contributions for the city's beautification efforts. They'll contribute $50,000 annually to rare crews, the library, schools, and senior centers. <laughs> and perform 320 volunteer hours. So we can move on to hear from the, the applicant when we enter the special land use and site plan items of the agenda. But right now, I think the commission's op um, opening up for a public hearing. 
Is there anybody in the public that wishes to be heard with respect to 21145 Gratiot? Seeing none, we will close that public hearing. <coughs> Moving on to the next public hearing. Moses Rose's Shark Tail Project at 17375 8 Mile and 207, I'm sorry, 20709 Kelly Road as well as 20715 and 20717 Kelly Road. Ms. Broshashevsky. Thank you again. So again, um, we've been working with Jim and Joseph on this project who are here to represent the, the, the project today. Uh, McKenna, the, the planning department has reviewed the special land use and site plan application to operate a medical marijuana provisioning center located at the northwest corner of Kelly Road and Eight Mile. The project involves the demolition of two existing buildings and the renovation of one building and the creation of a dog park. The site plan is dated from 2021. Let's talk about some of the subject site improvements. They again are re renovating the uh, existing building that is to the most, most north of the site and demolishing the other two buildings. The estimated project is to be worth $3.3 million. Um, it should be noted that the commercial building will have a second floor office space and a first floor marijuana provisioning center. In order to comply with the city's code of ordinances, the applicant must operate the provisioning center in a freestanding building without multiple uses. This means that the second floor has to be used to just for marijuana provisioning purposes, like their general office space. It can't be an additional retail use. Uh, and that must be a note on the site plan, which the applicant is aware of. They also must combine their parcels. And um, let's talk about some of the community benefits. The biggest community benefit for, to the I see for the city is that the project will um, require will remediate the existing brownfield. So there is a leaking underground storage tank on the site from the Mobile One Lube Express, former Mo Mobile One Lube Express location. And the, pro the applicant commits to remediating the site and bringing the site back to the appropriate environmental standards as directed by the Department of Ener Env Environment, Great Lakes and Energy. Um, other site enhancements include resurfacing the public alleyway, creating a dog park and a community garden, providing public art, planter boxes along Eight Mile and Kelly Roads, providing electric vehicles, charging stations, and occasion occasionally hosting a food truck. Um, they also commit to installing a basketball court at, and batting cages at the Memorial Park, and community educational seminars, and a charitable donation to the East Detroit Tiger Cats. Thank you, Ms. Brashevsky. Is there anybody in the public that wishes to be heard on this matter? Anybody? Seeing none, we'll close the second hearing of the public, or I'm sorry, the second public hearing. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Chair. Yes. Um, Wendy Popko. Hi, Wendy. Do you care to address this topic? Okay. I mean, I mean, I think there's no questions or anything. Well, the, the commission hasn't had the opportunity to view this. So if you have, if you'd like to present um, your mural. If, if you would mind, if you just said the stand at the podium, please. Thank you. Don't forget that was during COVID, too. Yes. No. Thank you. <laughs> hey, what better time to paint than when you're alone? Um, hi, I'm, I'm Wendy, Wendy Popko, and um, I, I design and paint large-scale outdoor murals um, to reflect the, throughout Macomb County and um, to reflect the community that I am immersed in. And uh, yes, I did paint the Rainbow Maker in the um, children's garden that was a DIA PIPA project and what I start with is an illustration board and to show you exactly what you're going to get and uh, use that as the strategy for creating the public art piece so you know exactly what will be going up on the wall 
So these are just a few examples of my work throughout, like, you know, Sterling Heights, and um, I did a piece, uh, not last year, but the year before, that was augmented reality, and it was interactive. Uh, there was a gaming element, a part of it, and so, yeah, it's a lot of fun, but I still love the Rainbow Maker, as you can tell. Um, but I had envisioned for the, um, the privacy fence to either go with like a simple, um, like a monochromatic, you know, wavy, uh, like blue lines, kind of uh, like waves of water, or, you know, in the other clip, you'll see the, um, the dog images uh, to reflect the dog park. So something really simple, something that is pleasing to the eye, but not too um, loud and, and um, attention grabbing. So, thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, does anybody else have anything to say on this matter? Seeing none, we'll close that public hearing. We'll move into new business. Item A, Ms. Brashevsky. Again, I've had the opportunity to work with Mark and at Holistic Health on this project. So um, pending any comments from the public during the public hearing, the planning department recommends that the planning commission consider the following motion. Uh, I move to recommend approval of the proposed special land use for the medical marijuana provisioning center at 21145 Gratiot to city council with the required and recommended conditions outlined in the planner's review dated December 17th, 2022, and in the engineer's letter dated January 24th, 2023, excluding item number four, as it is our professional opinion that a decorative, decorative screening wall would improve the character of the neighborhood and walkability. And so we make this recommendation based on the following findings of fact. The community benefits provided by the applicant create a net positive impact on the community. With the community benefits, the project is harmonious with the master plan and an improvement to the community, and the applicant will provide all required and recommended conditions as outlined in the planner report, which will uplift the project even more. And I do want to say when we open up to this, the site plan review, I did have the opportunity again to discuss with Mark at the site earlier this week different um, ideas of how we can improve the site more. So I do want to modify my recommendations of approval as we move to the site plan. And these pertain towards the screening wall requirements. But this is the discussion of the special land use. So um, I guess it's the time if you have any questions for me or the applicant. Thank you. Thank you. We'll start down here. Ms. Yulinski, do you have any questions for Ms. Rushevsky or the applicant? I do not. Ms. Roll. No, I don't. <clears throat> Mr. Lubeck? No. Mr. Lalonde? No. Ms. Moody? Cut loose. One of the questions I had uh, when I was going through using these documents pertains to the additional community benefits. And uh, my question is, is in the event the business does not find itself profitable. Will they be in a position to, to stand up to their end of the bargain with the additional benefits for the East Point? Mr. Albright, this is a conversation I've had with two individuals as well, and Ms. Moody came up with it too. If I may, uh, if, would, if you would mind putting your name and oh sure, on the, thank you. Um, 
So uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to be able to uh, present to the Planning Commission here in East Point. I, I would like to thank the commission uh, that went through this application process. Uh, it was a bit of an arduous process. It was long, but everything was done extremely well. Um, I'm an attorney who has gone through applications in cities around the state of Michigan, and I've seen it done every different way. And I would say that East Point handled the marijuana applications better than any other city I've dealt with. So I, I would just like to thank everybody on that commission for their hard work. I, I know they really put a lot of hard work into it. Um, in our application, we did propose uh, once profitable um, giving $50,000. I think that's specifically what the community benefit you're talking about. All of the other community benefits we are uh, promising and, and will deliver. Um, with that being said, um, my experience is that profitability for this type of business is, nothing's guaranteed in this world, but um, is extremely, extremely likely. I work with hundreds of these businesses around the state of Michigan. Um, to be super profitable or you know making millions of dollars or something like that is, uh, is you know it takes being good business people um, these are seasoned operators at holistic health wayne um, they have multiple already profitable already successful similar businesses um, and i believe that it's an extreme likelihood that they will be able to make good on their promises but of course they need to get to that level of profitability to be able to start donating and giving back to the community organizations that we promised it seems like a very valid point given the commodity price of marijuana has fallen through the floor uh, and there would be some concerns i would think about the ability of, of, of steady and, and good profitability a couple of years ago when we were working on this ordinance it seemed like forever we were told how wonderful everything would be and now you see the commodity prices are going through the floor and i have actually seen built uh, businesses go out of business because of these things so if i'm may just speak to that issue the commodity pricing which you are 100 percent correct the price of marijuana went down by 53 percent you know last year i think it stayed pretty steady since then um generally i'd have to check the updated reports i think they're coming out in april uh the cra puts them out but that generally affects the grows and the processors not the retail side um the retail side of these operations whatever the commodity price is is what they are per so if the commodity price goes down by 50 percent that means that they're purchasing it for 50 percent less but they're still making their margins when they sell it to the public generally when you see these type of businesses fail i would say there's two major reasons and this is just you know my opinion having watched this uh, but it's usually poor planning from the city which i don't think is here at east point for example when the city allows like an unlimited number of these and so there's so much competition that certain less good operators fail um, that would be the number one reason um, and the number two reason would be setting up a lot of these businesses were set up in like kind of the middle of nowhere in a lot of cities um, where there's just not the population and maybe they were the only one in the area for a while, but as other cities set up, that's not gonna be an issue here in the city of East Point. The population should certainly be able to support the three, um, the three businesses that you guys are expecting to approve. So I don't see any of those issues affecting Holistic Health Wayne. Does anybody on the commission wish to be heard or have any questions? Ms. Ulinski? Role? Thank you. No, I don't. Mr. Lilbert? Ms. Moody? No, I don't. No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, I, I'll also add that the applicant, the applicants have committed to write in their site plan um, submission. So this is a, a recommendation upon or a requirement um, to write the additional community benefits within their revised site plan re revision. So their community, additional community benefits will be included in the site plan itself, and the project must meet all of the requirements listed in the site plan. So in that way, we have a somewhat, in, I'm not a lawyer, but contract or agreement. And in addition to that, 
the applicant has already entered an agreement with the city to provide the additional community benefits with the economic development department and through the site, the, the applicant selection process. So we have two ways where um, we will receive the community benefits other than the word from the, the applicants themselves. Thank you. It just seemed like the spirit of the whole scoring process, part of the scoring was the community benefit. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would hate to see that the community benefit would ever be shirked because then that license that would have been granted was kind of not right because somebody else who would have fulfilled the bar their agreement could have missed out. So thank you for putting that in. Moving on to item B, considering the site plan. Oh. Um, yes. Chair, do you have a vote or a recommendation? Oh, sorry. No worries. Do I have a motion moving forward with this on item A, concerning the special land use or holistic health? I'll make a motion to uh, recommend the approval of the proposed special land use for the Medical Marijuana Provisioning Center stated in the packet and verbalized by uh, Ms. Brzezowski. We have motion. Do we have support? Support. We have motion and support. Secretary, please call the roll. Ms. Ulinski, yes. Mr. Lalonde? Yes. Mr. Broll? Yes. Ms. Moody? Yes. Mr. Lubeck? Yes. Chairman DeHunt? Yes. Moving on to item B, consideration of the site plan for holistic health. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so again, I referenced this conversation with Mark earlier, who represents Holistic Health. Um, but I would like to amend the recommendation on page 19 of the screening wall between Hayes and the building. So I would like to remove the planner's recommendation to um, produce a screening wall between the building itself and Hayes, so um, behind here. And the reason is uh, the applicant has committed to enhanced uh, landscaping in that area and also enhanced um, west elevation in that area. And we want to keep that area fluid for foot traffic coming from the memorial or parking lot or the residence. So we want to make it more of an entryway as opposed to requiring a permanent buffer. The other item is the memorial site itself. Um, there's an existing screening wall right here. That's an existing six-foot screening wall. Uh, I can show, um, well, actually, in the report that you received, you saw the conditions of the screening wall. Mark and I visited the site, and I think the, con the screening wall could be painted. Um, so I could, I could amend my recommendation to have the existing six-foot screening wall be painted. But um, with the concession or agreement that this three or this existing screening wall be removed, <laughs> I don't know why this is giving me a hard time. And it um, was removed from the screen. A little bit. <laughs> yes, you're right there, Commissioner. Thank you, um, or Vice Chair. So anyway, the existing screening wall here is actually four feet, and it does not meet ordinance requirements. So it needs to be reduced to three feet. And I would recommend a three-foot decorative masonry wall with landscaping um, to be produced here. These are items that we discussed at the site earlier this week. And that's why I would like to amend the planner's report. But ultimately, it's up to the Planning Commission. Chair, I have a question on that. What do you mean by decorative wall? What does that mean? That's a great question. I have some examples. Okay, so the city of East Point allows three different types of decorative screening devices, um, or I should just say screening devices. The first one is a masonry wall, as we can see here, with additional landscaping. That's a plus, but also it's required through our parking lot landscaping requirement. The second is a three-foot planting plant screening wall. And then we also provide a berm option. The berm option is not um, feasible for this site because we don't have enough room. So it's either the masonry wall or the um, 
the plant screening. And then to get to your additional question on what types of screening walls, well, I pulled this um, handout. It's like we planted this. We didn't plant this conversation. But I, I pulled this handout from the Berkeley um, DDA, Downtown Development Design Guidelines. And they have a, a great, great guidelines to design a parking lot. And these are the different types of screening walls that they allow, decorative screening walls. Just three feet high. Okay, thank you. Does anybody else have any questions about this? Ms. Brzezewski, do you have anything else to add? No, um, I would amend the, recommend the recommendation here in italics and just add that we require enhanced west facade uh, design and enhanced landscaping between Hayes and the building. Um, but remove the need to have the screening wall between Hayes and the building. And we also require the three foot screening wall at the memorial site, but the applicant, if you wish, could use, um, could reuse the, the six foot, existing six foot wall, but paint it. Would it be accurate to say that, you know, that it, the existing six foot wall you suggested would be painted and then a screening wall so in other words, maybe if that was part of the motion, that it'd be based on administrative <coughs> approval in terms of the wall itself and, and, and the, uh, you know, the selection of what type of uh, screening wall? Y yes, that's a great point. It would be administrative approval through the zoning ordinance guidelines and the zoning ordinance requires, uh, it has its own des design guidelines. So it requires a brick masonry wall. Our new updated zoning ordinance has other options, but um, this, we're reviewing these projects with our existing ordinance. Thanks. Does anybody wish to make a motion? I'm sorry, were you, I thought you were just asking if we had questions on that one part. I have a couple questions. Oh, please. For the, for the applicant prior to, well, actually, I think I have one more for, for Mara. Can you, can you go back and list the community benefits again for this particular applicant, this particular site plan? Yes, I can put them on the screen too. So, um, does that help? Do you want me to read it? Yeah, could you read it? Sure. Um, so the entire site will be improved to create a building that looks like from this uh, to this. And the subject site improvements are demolishing the existing 8,000 square foot commercial building and then creating the new 3,000 provisioning center. Additionally, on that provisioning center, they will have solar roof panels and a white roof to aid reflectivity. And like that's a, a component or an example of an energy efficient design. Um, of course, landscaping improvements will be made because they are required. And the entire development is anticipated to cost about $2 million. Okay. Um, the memorial site is anticipated to be an investment of 135000 And it will include a parking space that the planning department's recommended that be required to be a public parking space and we can discuss with the applicant but I think the applicant agreed to do that and the applicant can also ask any questions too that they have in the review at this time after we're addressing these questions <laughs> just want to give you an opportunity and mature trees so the memorial site will also have trees a walking path bike paths or bike racks benches and a plaque to honor first responders and veterans and then <clears throat> additional community benefits that are not related to the site are adopting flower beds and parks, contributing $50,000 annually to um, these separate organizations, and perform 320 volunteer hours. Perfect. That's what I was looking for. So 
um, on the, uh, the the memorial site itself, you're saying the applicant has agreed to make that a public parking location? That is the recommendation of the planner. Okay. Okay, so I'll come back to that. Can you can you go back to the the other benefits that you listed the last three? All right. So are those the adopt flower beds, the contributions to the five different uh, organizations, and the volunteer hours? Those are recurring year after year, correct? I'm not the one to answer that. I I would defer to the applicant or the city administration. Uh, yes, the intention is for all of those to be reoccurring. I, as far as the adoption of the flower beds, my understanding is that we would adopt them once and then continue to maintain them year after year. Yeah. So not, I, I guess, n not necessarily adopting more and more f flower beds each year. Um, but the 320 hours, 100% reoccurring. And um, I spoke to the $50,000 before. Um, if you have any further questions on that, I'm happy. I have other questions in a second, but okay. just going back to the administrative process, since this is a reoccurring contribution, this is an important facet of this particular plan. Is that is that information, are those amounts part of the annual permit process for this business to be licensed to operate in that location? Is that part of the process that they will, somebody's checking to make sure that those contributions are made? Um, Chair? Yes, but is that a question for Mr. Albright? Well, I'm, I can attempt to answer, um, and we can clarify with the, the city administration, but we can put um, an alert on the property when it comes to our annual business license renewal and work with the city clerk. We do that for the shared parking agreements as well. So um, that's something that the planning department and building department are able to do. Yeah, I mean, I, this kind of goes back to one of the other things we were talking about. It's not related to this, but as part of the process of the annual permit is to mm -hmm. go through and make sure they're checking off on these types of items. And this is a good example of the type of thing that we need to make sure that we're getting that, that benefit is, is being paid. That's part of what we're agreeing to. So, um, If the applicant wants to answer a couple questions, is that cool? All right. Absolutely. All right, so going back to the park, and the park and it, are you agreeing to make that I mean so the recommendation I under, understood was that that could be a public parking lot are you, is that the agreement here well the proposal was essentially um, and I, I'm not the arc I'm just the lawyer here but um, I did I did work on this application extensively the proposal is that this would be a site for the public to be able to park at and enjoy um, it's it's a memorial but it's also something like a park you know to that can be enjoyed a garden yes uh, a garden to be enjoyed um i wouldn't classify it as a park it's quite small but it, it is for the public's benefit in the city of east point so because of that it would have to be the public would have to be able to park there it's, yes um there could be other businesses in that area that if that was a public parking space, then that it, a business that may not meet the parking requirements now would m potentially meet it if they were close enough to those parking spots, right? Because if it's a public park, now it's a private park. They don't have the right to use those parking spots. So I'm trying to understand, is this a, a public or is it a private parking spot? That's I mean, the, the intention of the Memorial Garden was for the public benefit. Um, so and for the public to be able to park there. Um, I, based on my understanding of the nature of that area and the parking lots in the area, the businesses in the area and their adequate parking, I wouldn't think that that would be an issue with uh, businesses wanting to utilize those extra parking spaces. But my belief is that the intention of do, essentially donating this piece of property and building this garden, this memorial garden, is for the public benefit of the people of the city of East Point to be able to take advantage of. Still confused though, are you donating it to the city as a, and then it becomes city property or is it? It's, well, it's, I guess being used for city benefit, I don't believe that the intention was to, do, like where the land's actually donated. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly something that we could discuss with the city as far as like, 
you know, donating it. Um, it the, certainly the intention was for the public benefit, but at this time the proposal wasn't to actually, you know, obviously okay. donate yeah. the property itself, but to allow the public to go there, to park there, to enjoy the garden. Yeah, I mean, if if the city wanted it to be no business parking or something like that, I don't I don't think that would. The I'm, intention was not to provide parking for other businesses necessarily, um, but for the public to be able to enjoy that area. Yeah, so I'm, I understand that, that it's not the intent, but the nuance is if it's private or public, it does have an impact on how a different site plan could come through from one of the neighboring business. I understand that it probably won't be an issue. I get it, but I'm trying to understand if it's public or private okay so i understand you want to keep it private i mean that's what i'm hearing that's if that's the intent that's fine it's for public use i get it um was it, there was a char one charging station and there is a bike rack is that i know that was a suggestion is that what the agreement is here i believe the bike rack i would leave it to um to so um Nurse Naraha is our architect here today. So rather than me try to fumble my way through describing the specifics, if I could ask Nurse up. Uh... Great, thank you. If you would mind, just write your name on the piece of paper there, please. Thank you. Mara, there's a slide that shows kind of like the depiction of that spot. If you could find it, I don't have a page. Do you have a page? This one? Yeah. Yeah. Page four of the handout. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. That was it. One back. Right there. Good evening, good evening, everybody. My name is Nerson. I'm an architect with Driven Design Studio, the architect uh, of the project. Um, from my understanding, there is one electrical vehicle spot provided at the building proper, and then one in the um, in the memorial park. No. Just, I apologize. Just at the building. I apologize. There's one at the building. Yes. Okay. What about a bike bike rack? The bike, yeah, at the Memorial Park. Okay, I'm sorry if these are, or if these are in the handout. The way I read it is these were suggestions. So I don't know whether or not, unless I don't have, the, unless I'm reading that wrong. So the way I'm interpreting is these were suggestions. It's not this is what it is. So I'm trying to understand right, some of these definitive answers to those questions. Certainly, sure, certainly. Sure. Yeah. Okay, a bike rack at the at the at the park. Okay, correct. That's good. I like that. Um, the other thing, the reason I had this pulled up. Nursa is currently on the outside of the, the walkway, right? Right now there's just grass represented there. There are two trees, one on each side of that drive. And I think the, the two larger trees is a nice piece. Can we do that? Is there a reason that you removed it? No, no, we would, this is just the, I'm sorry that I, that I marked, that we're, we would keep those trees, any of the, in anything that's not dead or, you know, we would keep as many, as much mature Foliages we can certainly keep okay. those trees. I was out there the other day and they're, they're great. Yeah, it's a nice entrance. Yeah. Okay, that yeah. was yeah. that's a good answer. Um, okay, a lot of my questions are being answered because now this is staying a private park, so I know who's maintaining it. I know who's gonna, you know, I know who's responsible. There were questions whether or not this is public or private, and, and so. I think you've answered my questions there. We had a que the que donations questions were answered. I think I think I have my questions answered. Thank you, Commissioner Lubeck. You had a question? Yes. Could someone describe to me what 320 volunteer hours a year look like? Um, so this is something that I have seen uh, take place in action. So essentially, um, Holistic Health Wayne would commit to having their staff you know so they would be paying their staff for the time essentially to be volunteering for various city organizations so when you put together that many hours you know spread amongst the staff it's not any particular staff member that's spending too much but we want the staff 
generally interact, you know, the goal is to hire staff from the community as much as possible, but also having the staff be a part of the community. And the best way to sort of ingratiate yourself within a community is to donate and volunteer for community organizations. So um, doing the math, you know, eight hour days, it would be essentially um, 48 hour days per year um, that would be donated by the uh, Holistic Health Wayne um, and their staff. Also making their staff, you know, kind of grounding it within this community. Did you have any other questions as to that? Well, yes, because I'm thinking you've got a park and a memorial that needs to be maintained. I've heard about adopting flower beds. Those all take time. The time to do that is in addition to those 320 hours? That was the intention, yes. So the 320 hours would be like volunteering with community organizations that would, yeah, specific things like that. Um, but generally like working with the city to donate volunteer hours um, and then the, mem the memorial garden and the flower beds would be kind of separate from that 320 hours. Okay, thank you. So if Commissioner Ulinski needed people at the cruise for volunteering, we know where to go. Get out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> um, just one question on the flower beds. How You said beds, so what, how, what does that consist of? What's the number? Um, I don't think that was, you know, we're happy to talk with the city about that. Um, I don't think the direct number of flower beds was contemplated, just something that we wanted to do to work with the city okay. on that front. All right, thank you. Do we have any other questions from the commission? Anything down here? Mm -hmm. I, I do have a question under the um, improvement to the community. Is that, no, no, I, re, I re, correct myself. Excessive or additional cost to the public services. I do have a question there. Um, my question is, it state here will not create excessive additional requirements at public cost for public facilities and services and will not be detriment to the economic welfare of the community. My question is, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that we see here in the, the wording that the facility will be required to have their security surveillance cameras, their robbery and burglary alarm systems. Am I understanding this to say that you are going to take care of all of your your security, and you will not be compelled to utilize the uh, the police department here in East Point. Or if so, you will reimburse for the time and money spent out to protect your facility. So, um, so just like any uh, corporate citizen of the city, I'm sure that at times there will be, uh, you know, n we would plan on being partners and working with the police department of the city of East Point. Um, surprisingly, just to kind of let you know, it's a lot more rare um, than you would think. As somebody, you know, I represent a lot of these facilities around the state of Michigan. Um, and when there is adequate security on site, you actually see a lot less issues than you would think. Um, they will be taking care of their own security as much as possible, but there comes a time when the police need to get involved. If there's a crime committed, um, the police do need to be called. Um, we haven't, it wasn't contemplated anything about um, reimbursing the city for police expense. I'm sure we're open to talking with the city. I think it would be much less than you would yeah, I mean, I just think that it's much less than you would imagine. Um, I think like a jewelry store is probably gonna have a lot more issues with having to call the police than um, dispensaries because of the amount of security that's already there. Um, I, I could cite to you many different studies that actually show crime is lower in the area immediately surrounding uh, 
medical retail establishment um, or just a general marijuana retail establishment, that crime actually goes down. And the reason it does is because of that added security. People generally don't like committing crime when there's cameras everywhere and it's well lit. Um, so I don't believe that there would be any increase in crime related to this, at least based on the, all the studies that I've seen, that would cause a need that that would be like an additional strain on the City of East Point Police Department. But certainly we plan on working with the City of Pl East Point Police Department if they wanted to watch any videos or see anything or utilize the cameras. If there was an accident on the road, we would be you know, wanting to be partners with the City of East Point as much as possible. Absolutely. Anybody have any other questions? I do. Mr. Bro. Going back, I, I forgot to ask this. Was this, I'm curious, um, was this parking lot, it's currently a parking lot, the entire thing is, I think, blacked up. Um, was, is that part of the, was that owned by the same landowner that I'm assuming sold the property? Uh, yes, it was. It was, okay. I, and then just talking about the current building, if I understand it correctly, the current building is attached to the building to the, I guess, the north of it. Is that true? It is not. It's not attached to it? They're not attached. They are extremely close. Okay. Uh, but they are not attached. Okay. So they have separate walls, the two buildings. They do. Okay. Yeah. I didn't realize that. I drove by and I was like, wow, that's, I thought they were attached. Okay. So is the current building's being torn down. Correct. A new building's put up, of course. And then we're talking about new concrete, right? Is the, like, it's both in this spot, in this parking lot and in the parking lot uh, adjacent to the building? Okay. Yes. Everything. It's all new. Okay. Okay. Thank you. It's a tasteful design. Thank, Thank you. you. Anyone else have any other questions? Are we prepared to make a recommendation? Chair, can I add something? Yes. I'd just like to clarify on page seven of your review, um, the one, two, the third paragraph down, the, we recommend that the East Point Memorial parking lot is provides public parking, but is not um, publicly owned and maintained. So that's clarified here. Thanks. That's what I heard. I do have a question for Mara. Mara, when I read this review, it seemed to me like there were a lot of open-ended item things. And that's why I was asking a couple of the questions. There are a lot of things that I read that I thought were open-ended. Are are do you have questions that are open-ended that we didn't ask that we should be asking? Um, Not all site plans were like that, right? This one is more, a little, there were, there were, to me, there were more questions about consider this, consider that. Do you feel like we asked all the questions that we need to ask about open items? Thank you. That's a, that's a great point. Thanks. Um, I think that this plan, um, the special land use and the site plan applications, th this is not defer from the typical applications that I see. Every project has some outstanding conditions. And those conditions are either requirements or recommendations from the planning department. So um, when I say consider this and um, we recommend, I'm, I'm telling you that that's what the planning department recommends, but it's up to you to decide if you want to authorize it as a final condition. So I would also like to extend that gratitude towards the applicant to see if they have any questions or follow up about any of the recommendations or requirements in the submission um, but again um, these items like the recommendations and the conditions or, and the requirements listed here are nothing will change the design that you see today which is why I they can be and have in the past been um, approved administratively and addressed administratively that's why I feel confident in having these number of conditions because they won't change the site plan that you see today well they won't say they don't change the physical character and um, building of, that you see today. Does that give you a change, Mr. Rowe? Yes, thank you. Okay. All right. So do we have anybody wanting to make a motion on this? Oh, um, Chair. Yes. Commissioner, I just want to say one more thing. In the recommended motion on page five, I do have um, two things that I I want the Commission to address so that might be what you're referring to um, but I would like I recommend that we grant a waiver for the applicant so they don't need to screen the rooftop solar panels and I also um, 
recommend that we add a requirement that the mural is constructed within one year of receiving their certificate of compliance. Okay. Anything else? No, those are the two items of consideration. All right. Now do I have somebody willing to make a motion? I'm hearing crickets. I'm sorry, Mara was, I'm taking notes. Mara, I, was that one year on the mural constructed? I'm sorry, one year after when? Receiving their certificate of compliance with the building department. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I'll make a motion to recommend approval of the proposed site plan for a medical marijuana provisioning center and memorial at 21145 Gratiot. Provided special land use approvals are granted by city council and to grant a waiver for no screening for the rooftop solar panels and the mural to be constructed one year after receiving certificate of completion. Yes. Can I add some, some of the items I clarified? Please. Okay. Um, the parking, the, the park will remain private. The bike rack is included in the park. Charging station is in the building's parking lot. Isn't nope. that already in there? for clarification it might be okay uh, administrative approval of the wall in the parking area in the in the park area in the in the art the, the I guess the color of the wall the Mural. artistic yeah aspects of the wall and then I would just like added the annual review of the you know the ancillary benefits the, the 50,320 hours whatever we want to collectively call those and those should be part of the annual review of the permit process for this business. Do we have support of that joint motion? I'll support it. I'll support it. We have motion of the joint ordinance of the joint. It's teamwork. <laughs> yes, it makes the dream work. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, City Attorney. Well done, you guys. Um, if you if you don't mind, I would like to recommend that we add um, that we require enhanced design of the west facade of the building, enhanced landscaping between Hayes and the building, remove the screening wall requirement between Hayes and the building, and also allow for, um, if you wish, uh, for them to paint the existing six foot screening wall at the Memorial Park but construct a new three-foot screening wall at the Memorial Park. Ms. Ulinski, you have that? I'm getting there. Okay. So we have a, tri uh, a, tri uh, a triumvirate here. <laughs> That's made the motion. Commissioner Moody has seconded it. Secretary, please call the roll. Ms. Ulinski, yes. Ms. Moody? Yes. Mr. Brawl? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Lalonde? Yes. Yes. Mr. Lubeck? <laughs> yes. Chairman DeHunt? Yes. Could you please make sure the record reflects that we have three pieces of information added to that? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being a good partner. I know that the city appreciates follow through and everything. Moving on to item C, Ms. Brashashevsky. Okay, I'll pull up this project. Give me one moment. All right. Um, so the applicant is here today, Moses Roses uh, slash Shark Tale, 
we've got Joseph and Jim in the room and the planning department, pending any comments from the public during public hearing, we recommend the planning commission consider the following motion. Um, we recommend that we table the proposed special land use request for the provisioning center because, uh, well, based on the following findings of fact, the applicant did not provide the required of elevation drawings within the site plan submission. The site plan submission was due um, three weeks ago, thereby preventing the planner and the planning commission from the ability to determine if the project is harmonious with the character of the neighborhood and if the project is consistent with the intent of the zoning ordinance. Um, and the applicant must make the required recommended, recommended conditions outlined in the planner's review, dated December 27th, 2022. I'll make a motion to table this based on the planner's recommendation. I'll second. We have motion in support for tabling. Ms. Ulinski, sir, second. Right. Yes. I'm sorry, who seconded that, please? Mr. Lalonde. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Lubeck. Yes. Mr. Lalonde. Yes. Mr. Broll. Yes. Ms. Moody. Yes. Ms. Ulinski, yes. Chairman DeHaunt. Yes. As we have just tabled this, do we go into item D? Yes. Ms. Brzezewski. Thank you, Chair. Um, so again, since we did not have the elevation drawings with us until Monday, um, we, we, could, we cannot recommend approval of this project right now and recommend tabling. However, the applicant does have the opportunity here to speak about their project and represent their project, and the Planning Commission has opportunity to ask any questions so that we can be prepared in March. Um, and then we also, the planning department recommends that the applicant submit revised drawings um, within one week. The application submission is due actually um, Tuesday, the next, next week Tuesday, but um, we're able to intake the application in one, in one week from today to help out if that's needed and be prepared for March, our March meeting. So the applicant actually provided these renderings a couple days ago, and I do have the elevation drawings I can share if the Planning Commission has specific questions. But if not, I can work with the applicant during office hours on specific questions that I need a little bit more information on to, um, to meet the zoning ordinance requirements when we review the elevation drawings. Commissioners, do you have any questions, feedback? Anything? No. All right, so do I have a, uh, can I get a motion to table consideration of the site plan? I will make a motion to table consideration of the site plan based on the planner's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, City Attorney, to the March meeting. And then would we also add the requirement that the revised submissions are submitted to the Planning Department within one week today? As I said, based on the uh, planner's recommendation. Okay. Thank you. In total. We have a motion. Do we have support? I support. We have motion and support. Secretary, please call the roll. Mr. Lubeck. Yes. Ms. Moody. Yes. Mr. Lalonde? Yes. Mr. Broll? Yes. Ms. Ulinski, yes. Chairman DeHaan? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Brzezewski. Moving on to item seven, unfinished business. Chair, I'd like to defer to our senior principal planner, Laura Hall. Thank you. Evening, commissioners. Um, it is a pleasure again to be before you and present the draft zoning ordinance. Um, as you recall, um, there was a public hearing held at the January 19th special meeting of the Planning Commission where the draft ordinance um, was initially presented for discussion. Um, there is a memorandum in your packet um, dated January 25th um, that 
outlines some of those discussion points at that January 19th meeting and the um, recommended changes uh, that we will be incorporating for the final draft going to City Council. Um, the reason that the zoning ordinance um, has not been updated um, with those changes is so that we're still discussing um, the exact copy of the draft ordinance that was discussed on January 19th, so there's not multiple revisions floating around. And um, since that was tabled that evening, um, we can have a consistent discussion tonight um, regarding any other adjustments that you would like to see made prior to a recommendation to City Council. Um, the required public hearing has been held for the zoning ordinance. As it goes to City Council, there will be additional two readings um, before adoption by ordinance. And we are happy to um, answer any questions that you have this evening. The, um, as you can tell from our memo, the majority of discussion points from January 19th um, we are in agreement upon and will include um, in that final copy. Thank you. Commissioners, do we have any additional comments from the last meeting? Concerns? Mr. Broll? Well, I wasn't at the last meeting, but I do have a couple questions. I'm trying to go through all my notes. Some are notes, some are questions. I hope you guys can parse through some of the, have questions yourselves. Um, let's jump ahead to page 19. Height exceptions as it relates to are we all looking at the same thing here? I don't have the book. Uh, you have the uh, loose copy. Do you know what the loose copy is? Yeah, the one that wasn't bound. This is, all, uh, this is page, page 19, numbers. Chair. They're not uh, the same page numbers? Ooh. Okay. Well, I can go, I can just tell you the section, and then I'll tell you my question. Sounds good. So section 5172. Mm -hmm. Yes. So there's a list of things that are height exceptions and one of them that struck me was a elevator. Why would an elevator, I think the elevator should not be an exception. I'm trying to reason why that would be an exception from the height, maximum height of a building. Yes, yeah, so um, the, the reason that that clause is in there, um, typically um, in a mixed-use building, let's say it's four stories, um, the elevator shaft may um, peak above the, the roof height, um, but you wouldn't want to limit the building to then three stories just so you could accommodate the elevator shaft um, protruding above the, the roof of the building. Um, there was a similar case of this in um, the village of Lake Orion where they had a four-story mixed-use building in their downtown. Um, the shaft though is so located in the center of the building so that from the street or approaching you can't see um, you know because of the sight lines but the building is just slightly taller for the elevator shaft itself. So is this an exception to the maximum height or exception it is to the maximum height? So this yes. is saying if I read it correctly you could have a building let's say it was a MU3, regional mixed use, is 65 feet is your, your maximum height. So the way I read this then is it says you can have a 65 foot tall building and you can have an elevator shaft going above it. Correct. But why, I don't, so what, you could have a rooftop bar or what's? Uh, well, potentially you may have rooftop access, which would be an amenity to the residents who, who live there. Um, or if there's a, a restaurant <laughs> on the top floor or such. Um, but so that the elevator shaft could protrude above the roof of the building and, and access that top floor. Because hmm. the elevator then becomes, it's really part of the structure, you know? Like if you look at the content of the rest of these, right? Mm -hmm. You're talking about uh, a water tower, smokestack, ventilator, skylight. Elevator just, I mean, to me it seems, it doesn't seem like it belongs. Does anybody else feel the same way on this board? Commission? This is why we waited for you. No, I, I'm understanding what <laughs> what Ms. Ha is saying. Uh, you've got the mechanical components of an elevator that have to be above the building it's serving. 
Yeah, Th this is a standard. And provision. in order to accommodate that, you would have to have some way of, as she uh, very eloquently explained, if, if you're limiting to four stories and you need one extra story to accommodate the elevator shaft, then you, what you're essentially saying is you can only have a three story building or you can have a, a four story building without an ele elevator which probably isn't permitted because of ADA guidelines. You know, sometimes you hear what you want to hear, and I didn't want to hear that, but it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> is it, so is an HVAC would be part of that, right? An HVAC cooling system, is that in here? Um, cooling towers. Right. Well, that'd be above the, the roof line, right? Isn't that? Is Typ typical. Um, HVAC equipment on top of a building would not qualify for an exception to this to the schedule that would still need to fall within the height and be screened and typically those are you know three to five feet in height and they sit just below the parapet and they're screened on, on buildings so I don't see a concern with that with this okay what well, but just out of humor me why would it why would you have an exception or why would you have to have a listed exception for an elevator or a smokestack or a towers why would you have to have some of these exceptions but you wouldn't have one for hvac i don't understand it doesn't make sense to me just because of the typical height that's associated with a smokestack or an elevator it's going to be more than that three to five feet that an hvac unit typically would and and thus you're not you're not really able to screen it in the same way mm. okay fair enough we're the only one here that's the problem That just means am you've I, given a thorough job to reading the ordinance, Commissioner. Am I the only one asking questions? Because that, that way we waited for you. you did. Oh, Jesus, it's going to be forever. I apologize. You are one of the reasons we've tabled this because of your you made unique a, perspective. Made a mistake. Um, Wait a minute, uh, Chair. Do we? Does he have a hard cutoff? <laughs> uh, I make nine a motion o nine o'clock. <laughs> a lot of these are just notes not questions as I read them I'm learning that um, okay so section 5174 it's not my section 5174 it's mu1 go down a little bit oh, that mine's different it's weird there's mu1 oh there we go yeah okay all right, my question on this one is MU1 is meant to be, you guys should have, you guys should have waited for me. Um, it's, isn't it meant to be certain business fronts, but it also could be residential, is that true? Correct. All right. So this is along um, 10 Mile, uh, Stevens, um, Kelly. Yeah. Okay, so MU1, it, this hit here has a um, minimum ground floor height of 12 feet. Is that, is, is that's the minimum. How, what is the minimum on a typical house? These would apply to commercial structures only. If it's a, if it's a single family or a duplex, then those standards of the R1 or the R2 are gonna apply. So these are for non-single family or okay. duplex. Okay, makes sense. Oh, okay, 5183. It's, it's unbelievable. All right, so my question on 5183, section B, Seven. No. Parking and storage of commercial oh, recreational vehicles. There it is. Yeah, section B. Just curious, what is it? So if you look at B, it talks about the types of things that are included or excluded. Um, included. What's an altered vehicle? Second line.
Oh, um, so this could be I mean, I was thinking like a like a, a custom vehicle or something, right? Um, I think this is intended to be like um, another type of recreation vehicle. So it could even be uh, like a golf cart. Okay, so a golf cart is in, is is a recreational vehicle. Okay, but that would not be an altered vehicle. Golf cart is manufactured, altered is something that you Customize. recreate. Yeah, you customize or recreate. I was thinking like a, a kit car. You know, so people take a, they buy a, a car and then they outfit it with all the different components, and it's actually a kit car. You know. City administration um, thinks this might be a, a typo, um, and that would actually make sense if it's an all terrain vehicle instead of ah, all terrain. All -terrain. Yeah. Terrain. Okay. So, okay. So, all terrain. Good. So we'll make that adjustment. Good. And then, Thank you. yeah, now it makes sense, right? Um, and now going down just a little bit to section three of three B, the same section. Yes. It talks about the uh, it talks about the storage of recreational vehicles. Mm -hmm. And then it says, let's read let's read it together. The storage of recreational vehicles on a residential lot or parcel for more than 40 hour, 48 hours will be limited to only those vehicles. This is where I'd stop and I'd say approved by the resident. Like, does it matter if they're owned? Does it matter if they're licensed? Does it matter if they're registered? It could be my cousin's four-wheeler, all-terrain vehicle. So it doesn't matter. Let's just let's just trim out the requirements of what what the condition is, why that vehicle is there, as long as it's approved by the resident. Otherwise, we get into who's making a judgment as to how that vehicle belongs there, why it belongs there. So I'd cut out all the details and just say, you know, 48 hours shall be limited to only those vehicles approved by the resident. Well, it says the occupants, that, there you go. I have an issue with that. Okay, let's hear it. I don't think, um, I think the devil's in the details with that because of I am a registered owner, and whether they're family, friends, whatever, uh, I'm not becoming a storage facility for someone else. So if I own the property, I own the, the house, whatever, uh, I, I think it should only be what's registered to the owner there. Well, I think that's what, that's what I'm suggesting, though. It has to be approved by the, re the resident. Whoever lives there says, this is, I want this here. To your point, you're the owner, you're the person that lives there, you don't want other vehicles there. You have the right to say, I don't want these here. That's what I'm saying. Right, I understand that, but then I think you could have properties that, like I said, become storage places. For 48 hours. Well, I mean, it is a 40-hour clause. Um, how often is that 48 hours enforced? Well, okay, but you know, then you can, you can also say, well, how are we gonna enforce who owns it, it's licensed to, it's registered, it's my cousin's, it's leased by, it's loaned, it's, you know, so how are we gonna enforce that? That's not really realistic either, so I, that's right. why I'm saying, like, if, if, the, if the resident wants a vehicle there, that should be the litmus test, not, and the vehicle is, belongs to my cousin Vinny, you know, I don't, I just don't, <laughs> I don't see, I don't see why we, we can't even manage that. Commissioners, this provision exists in your ordinance today, this, this specific provision here, the 48 hours shall and then following, mm -hmm. that was not changed as part of this update. Um, so we would defer to code enforcement or the city attorney if um, that would change at all in their enforcement of the ordinance. Otherwise, okay, we're happy but, to revise it. But then that, that changes, like to me, I the example I was thinking of, right? Somebody has an all-terrain vehicle and you go pick it up on a weekend because they live up north and you bring it home. Now you can't have it there for 48 hours because it's not yours, because it's not, you know, because it doesn't meet those two requirements. I don't own it, it's not registered to me, but I'm borrowing it from my cousin. Like, that, that happens all the time. Right. So that, that, that's why I'm saying that, that needs to change. Well, some, sometimes I think zoning ordinances are, are, 
you know, intentionally specific in that if there is an issue, if there's a complaint, if code enforcement needs to um, uh, enforce these ordinances, that they have the, the mechanism by which to do so. Um, otherwise, I'm sure there's plenty of instances in the city where that, that does happen and it doesn't need to be enforced. But if someone was doing that every weekend and... What you're saying to me is it doesn't... That's too small of a detail to worry about. I mean, that's the way I'm reading it, right? Don't worry about that detail. It's more, it's more of a mechanism for code enforcement, I would say, to, to follow if needed. Otherwise, um, this likely isn't, isn't going to be triggered. Okay, but, you know, so, so if I want to borrow an all-terrain vehicle from my cousin up north and I want to bring it home, I can't do that based on this. And I, I don't believe that's accurate. And so why, why would I have a provision in here that I disagree with that I don't think, irregardless of the, you know, code enforcement's going to catch her or not? I mean. Well, if you're borrowing it, I wouldn't think you're going to keep it at home for more than 48 hours. You're borrowing it to use it, not to have it sit on your property. And the example I cited was my cousin lives up in the U.P. and I drive it home because I'm going to need I think we have some input, input from city administration. Mr. Oh, Chair, I'm if sorry. I may. You, no. How'd you get over there? <laughs> you walked. Army crawl. Um, to uh, Ms. Hawes' point, I do believe that a lot of these are written for code enforcement to have the ability to enforce. Um, if you have an all-terrain vehicle or whatever that's in your driveway and it's not an issue, it's not... Nothing, nothing's going to happen. The problem becomes when we've received a lot of complaints that there are um, people working on cars at their homes. Sure. Um, so, you know, maybe it has to be something that it can't be, although we already have in there that it has to be operable. You can't have mm -hmm. any inoperable vehicles anywhere. But we get a lot of complaints that um, people are at their residences working on other people's cars and out in the street and, and things like that. So I think that, um, again, as Ms. Haw said, the, the code is really written to allow enforcement against violators. Okay, so if, if I want to go up north and, and get an all-terrain vehicle <laughs> for my cousin Vinny and bring it home because we're going to Indiana the next weekend, I can't do that based on this. Is, this. is it safe to say the likelihood of code enforcement coming along and actually running the license plate is, is that high, do you think? I, I get where you're coming from. So we're going to create zoning ordinances here that that we know are going to be broke. Is that the advocate, what we're advocating here? All right, so my question would be to our planners, How is there a way to rewrite this right. to accommodate both city administration as well as what Mr. Broll is inferring? No, I... But going back to city administration, what does it matter who owns it, leases it, borrowed by? What, that's I just said remove that if the resident has it there and they approve it there for 48 hours that's what they're entitled to beyond that they're not entitled to that that's what my suggestion is to remove that requirement of who owns it who registered it well playing the devil's advocate if I want to work on my friends cars in my driveway I'm gonna say I approve that these be here they may not be running, they may not be that. So maybe that it does, the language does need to be adjusted some way to cover um, both of those. To that point, the very next item for us is there are no recreation of vehicles should be fully operable. So to your point, you can't do a rebuild on, your, on that vehicle and have it in that condition. So. Uh, if I recall properly, we don't allow storage of vehicles on any other properties unless that vehicle belongs to the business at that location. And we don't allow other outside storage of vehicles. And what I'm seeing in this, in my interpretation, is we're kind of pretty much saying if the vehicle doesn't belong to you, you shouldn't be storing it on your property. 
Uh, yeah, especially after 48 hours. Now, sure. your cousin Vinny comes in from New York, and he parks his car with the mud in the tires in your parking lot or in your driveway. And he's there for two or three weeks. That's not really storing the vehicle. But if he comes over, drops it off, and goes to Yazoo, Alabama to handle a trial for four weeks, then that is storage. You went there with the movie reference. <laughs> nice. Well played. Um, I understand code enforcement won't catch it. It's just it feels to me like we're writing an ordinance that we know will be broken, and to me that does not feel right. But if as everybody stated, else in here, everybody else on this board is okay with that, then I'll buy off on it. I'm just telling you it doesn't feel right to me to make an ordinance that we know will be broke. Does anybody know when that ordinance actually got put on our books? Um, I'm sure April it predates everyone in this room. April 16, 2013. That was the latest revision. To, to, that sec to this recreational vehicle section. Okay been 10 years there's always room for improvement here an opportunity guys so can we improve the language to satisfy the city as well as mr. Paul as well as the Planning Commission as well as the Planning Commission mr. chairman if I could add yes. um, for the last 14 years I don't recall ever prosecuting a ticket that was issued to someone who was storing uh, snowmobiles, recreational vehicles, that kind of thing, on their property in excess of 48 hours. Um, so it isn't something that, if it is happening in the city, code enforcement is exercising its discretion, perhaps maybe talking to the property owner and inquiring as to the uh, status of those uh, vehicles. Um, but again, it, it's not a ticket that uh, in the last 14 years that I ever recall prosecuting, if that helps at all. <laughs> Me, my position, I mean, it's a, you know, if you guys want to move forward with it, we can move forward. Okay, let's move forward. Yes, he's he's got a lot of tag pages there. A lot of more notes again. I'm sorry, I have to read everyone as I go, I apologize. Okay, um, let's go to 50 dash. 160, 186 of Article 8. And, the, you know, and this may have been addressed and I may have missed it, but I'll just ask the question and, and, and look for somebody to, to uh, hit me back. We previously had applicants come in front of us that had like, pri they had private, their own private parking lots, but they for instance, like was an auto repair, and they want to stack vehicles, right? So that, however, I don't think, I didn't read in here that we allowed any provision for that type of stacking of vehicles in a controlled environment where the only people coming in and out of that parking lot are, you know, the, the owner and, you know, the people that repair the cars. Was that addressed, or is that addressed in here at all, or? We had that issue about four or five years ago where there was a company on Nine Mile Road that wanted to, what was it called? All points. Okay, all points. All points. So, you know, do we want to allow for that? I don't see a problem for not allowing for it again. I don't know if it's addressed in here. Maybe I missed it. You guys, anybody? Well, I mean, it's... Article 8, parking, loading, and access. Thoughts? I think I recall that, that site plan. Yeah. Um, I don't think that that is specifically addressed in here. If you'd like similar language added in, we can do that. I think so. Just for the controlled environments like that, I think we, okay. should, we should do that. All right. Thank you. All right, 50, same section, 
Could, can can you just define what off street parking? What does that mean exactly? So off street parking is any um, non public parking that's required for use. For parking. Correct. So if right, so nor so the, the question here or the way this parking ordinance is you typically there's two ways that you would look at what's parking for a business to meet the number of required parking spots, right? One is their, their own parking spot. Another one might be a shared agreement. Mm -hmm. And those are, those are both off, off street parking. Isn't a public, wouldn't a public park parking be considered off street as well? Public parking. If it's not on street, if it's a, if it's a dedicated public lot. Okay. So this, my question would be how far, you know, how far can an applicant push what is considered close this goes back almost to the applicant that we were talking about earlier potentially that was going to be public parking now it didn't turn out to be but you know how far can an can an applicant say well no that I've got public parking right around the corner over here that should count towards my parking that's my question how do we define that it's 300 feet per the shared parking agreement it's 300 feet from that structure to the public uh, lot or in the MU3, the mixed-use um, district, it's 500 feet. Oh, perfect. So if somebody was 400 feet away, not in MU3, they could not consider that part Correct. of their parking count. Okay, great. Thank you. Most of us paint tabs are notes, folks. All right. Um, section, let me see what... Article 9, landscaping. Section 50 200. Section art, item B. Fifty two hundred. What is the, the title of that? Um, Non-single family. Oh, am I reading that wrong? Uh, Non-single family landscape design standards. Okay. Okay. My question is on the, the first one, uh, the evergreen trees. Uh, so frontage, I was trying to think this through. Have we ever approved frontage trees being evergreen trees? And would we want them being one per every 20 feet? Those are very thick trees. I can't imagine putting an evergreen I think front. you'd have to define evergreen because there's so many different types but aren't they all an evergreen can be a short shrub okay that's a good point however in page 61 let me tell you what that is they're not short based on the definition of what a tree would be um, if you go to the minimum plant size? Yes. The eight feet in height, yes. Yeah, so they so think about that. Along the front of the street you would have evergreens that are at least eight minimum of eight feet tall every twenty feet. Don't you guess is that what we want? I don't want that. Create a wall. You don't want a wall along the front of either. Well I think it, the majority of cases you would see deciduous street trees. Um, perhaps on a corner lot, like for instance, um, off of Kelly, and I can't think of the side street, but um, on the uh, east side where the DTE substation is, you may want to require evergreen shrubs along the, the residential street and kind of provide more of a backdrop for that. Probably wouldn't be used in all cases, but it gives you a little flexibility. It's probably a true statement as well that as you guys are reviewing, as the professionals are reviewing those site plans you're going to drive people away from having evergreens along a main corridor and they would maybe be on the side corridor like you're saying the side street yes and most businesses especially are going to want the visibility anyway so they're going to prefer uh, deciduous all right and then it becomes just um we can always you know have them change the, the tree if that was we are discreet it just struck me as odd but um that makes sense just a little bit Okay, as I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, my first thought on this was trees 
between the street and the sidewalk. <clears throat> but looking at this, you're not saying that. The front yard area, correct? You are saying it's, it would actually not necessarily be in the right of way. Correct. There, there are area or instances. But in the, the front city. setback. Yes, where the utilities may prevent that. So this gives some flexibility either on you know either side of the sidewalk, within the front yard or within the right of way. Okay. Signs. I just have a comment. What? <laughs> wow. Article ten signs. Prohibited signs is the title. I have 50-210. I think we have a different number. 52-10. Prohibited signs. Okay. Item E on my list says a prohibited sign is one that is obscene, indecent, or immoral content. And my only comment is that is extremely subjective, and that is a matter of opinion. So... I don't know how you enforce that because one person's immoral is not another person's immoral. Well, there, there is protected speech, right? There's that. Yes. Um, so I think this would really only be triggered if it was you know, something offensive that needed to go to court and would be cited. Can we change the language there, though, and say something to the effect of anything that is, uh, the, what's the word I'm looking for, sexually offensive or, you know, anything that would be illegal for, for one to do or to put upon another person? Because he, uh, Commissioner Bowler was right. It is a very subjective language there. Uh, maybe something to the effect of, any sign that would violate one's rights to sexual freedom or, 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 or religious freedom or anything like that. I, I, it, it's a very valid point. I would ask the city attorney how this would be upheld in court. One look down at me. Yeah. <laughs> Did you catch that? <laughs> Actually, that language. Sadly, that doesn't answer my question, though. So I think that that language would be suitable for purposes of our ordinance. Uh, and it would just be, have to be something that would be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. And I think that's, you're correct, it is a very subjective standard. Um, one person's uh, interpretation of obscenity may be quite different from another person's uh, interpretation of that. Um, I think that the municipality would have to look at that on a case-by-case -case basis with the assistance of legal counsel and have a consulting um, uh, case law to determine if in fact a particular sign uh, did uh, meet that definition and then go from there. So, so, we'll go ahead, sorry. so what I'm hearing you say, it's a code enforcement tool. Yes. Yeah, there's no, um, unfortunately, there's no, when it comes to I didn't expect that we would get any, it would change. To be honest with you, I just thought it's an interesting. No, it's it's an interesting uh, statement. It kind of irritates me actually now that you bring it up. See, normally we're all reviewing this at the same time, and I can read my notes as you know, somebody else is talking. So I, no, but you're finding things that we didn't, and that was the purpose of this exercise. 
not all of us delve as deep into it as you do. Article 11, nonconformities. D1, code, uh, code D1. Yes. I'm trying to remember exactly. I, I'm trying to remember exactly my point here. I, I wrote that um, wh when does when does this get when does this get discovered? It says all non-conforming uses and structures are classified as Class B non-conforming uses and structures unless designated by the Planning Commission is Class A. When does that when does that happen? When does the planning commission designate that? So if if there was a nonconformity in the city, the and they're auto, automatically all of them are class B, right? They do not comply with the ordinance. If a property owner wanted to expand a nonconformity, they would need to have it designated as a class A, which means that maybe it is it isn't conforming because of unique parcel shape or the history of the build out of the site or something. Um, but it's not um, it's not a danger to the public safety and welfare. And it, its continuation may be actually appropriate. So that property owner would need to apply for a class A designation, make application with the city, and that would trigger um, a public hearing. So all the, the neighboring property owners would be notified. And they would come before the Planning Commission and state their case. And if the Commission found that it may be appropriate, um, that, then that use could be expanded or enlarged or whatnot. So is it, is it, only, is it true that you know, normally that would be discovered at the point where somebody wants to expand their building or whatever? That, at that point, we find out there's a nonconformity. It's a, they want it to be a class A, and that's where this issue would, would come up. Every, every nonconformity should be until they're not, right? Likely the property owner would come into the city and try to pull a building permit or ask for a zoning compliance, and then it would be found at that time that their building wasn't in conformance or the use wasn't in conformance anymore. And they would have the option of either not pursuing that expansion or that uh, modification or requesting that non-conforming Class A designation by the Planning Commission. Yeah. All right, thank you. I think we have, well, we, we almost had input from City Administration. She recoiled quickly. All right. She saw I, your notes. I don't actually have many more, no, many more questions. Article 12, Development Plan Reviews. Mm -hmm. um, 50-219 in 10 statement. Yes. I'm just interested. There's there's three different types of reviews, a site plan, a sketch plan, and a plot plan. I'm just curious, is that has that always been the case? That's always been the case, right? There have always been the site plan and the plot plan. Um, the sketch plan is new. Um, that is a more administrative um, review as a RRC best practice. So we're giving a little bit more flexibility for things like reoccupancies. Okay, good. And then if you go down just to 50-221, overview of the three project plans. Yes. I, I would change A2, talks about A2A actually, qualifying factors. Mm -hmm. The one family and two family residential is actually just, you would call it an R1 zoning. So we should change that to R1 zoning might want to keep one and two family, but should be listed as R1 zoning. Okay. And my last one, maybe, maybe not. Um, <laughs> under 13 special land uses. Um, I'm sorry, which, which number? Um, 13. Oh, Article, Article 13. 13. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, under special land uses. Okay, the very first item under called special land, it's 50-231, okay. may or may not have that, but the first item is, will be har harmonious with and according, in accordance with the general objectives of the master land use plan. Shouldn't that be the, shouldn't that be the future land use map? 
or conversely the master plan is there a land a master land use plan i don't think there is one it, it's referring to the the master plan um so by default it is including the future land use plan um just master land use is an, a comprehensive plan they're all inter interchangeable is it inter okay but all we right. can we can just say master plan okay that sounds good thank you for entertaining all my questions <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Brown. Thank you for reading. Did you get the bound, the circular bound? I do have the bound. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Yep. So before we ask, I ask for any sort of uh, motion here. Can we make sure that everything is pristinely dotted, spelled correctly, commas, all that good stuff, um, before we send it off to City Council? And we also do have a mechanism, if I'm not mistaken, that we can make amendments and changes to this if we need to should something arise that we missed at any time in the future and the zoning ordinance is a it's a living document right it it's bound to change in the future does any other can i, I have one more to follow this may be more of a statement but i'll ask a question first is it true that the items contained in r1 are not necessarily contained in r2 the way it, you know, before it, B1 was always included in B2. Oh, yes. Right? So there was a step up. R1 was in card included in R2. Is it true that that does not happen in any of these ordinances? R1 is not in R2, is not inherent in R2. It might, there might be parts of it, but it's not inherent. It's not automatic. Correct. Yes. Yes. That, that is one major change. So the table of, of permitted uses will show the relationship between the districts, but it is not. Um, it's in intentionally not like that so that you're not reading the B3 district and going back to the B1 and then the OS one yeah. um, and finding I, that that's rather confusing for applicants and and easily allows for discrepancies yeah I thought that was a really important and well thought out change um, because the there are some things where it doesn't step up appropriately and mm -hmm. if it did step up that would be a problem so i thought that was really good while you're on this slide i did have one actually um under fences dt downtown and just entertain me when when would there be a fence downtown I'm, i was trying to think that through is it just are we talking about an alley wall or mm -hmm. what would be a fence down it could it could even be a, a like a decorative fence on the side of a property. Okay. All right. Or if there was some um, parking lot screening. Okay. Good. Like the schoolhouse Thank you. with its white picket fence. What's that? <laughs> like the schoolhouse with its white picket fence. That's there you go. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, do we have any other comments? Mr. Lenski? Yeah. Mr. Brawl, you're satisfied? I'm good. Mr. Lubeck? Yes. Please. I'm agreeing that. Oh, okay. Ms. Moody? None. Mr. Lalonde? All right. Dare I say this? Can I get a motion to make a recommendation that we send this to City Council? I will object to that because we're not sending it to City Council until we have received a final copy to go through okay. and approve and send it to City Council, which is what I thought I heard earlier this evening was the intention that you're going to take all of the information and you're going to put it into for more or less the final copy for us to review before sending it to city council that way we know what we wanted is in there and what we didn't want is out of there commission thoughts okay how would we feel down here it's different the in if I could just clarify, the, the intention um, on McKenna's part was to make the changes for the City Council draft. So that everything at the Planning Commission that was discussed was based on that initial draft okay. from the 19th public hearing. So I do believe that there were some pertinent, and there were some salient points here that need to be addressed as well that were brought forward. Uh, do we need to table this then until the next meeting when you have a finalized draft? What is, what you know, is the, I'll, I'll support Mr. Lubeck on that. We do, um, there are many times that we have administrative changes or, or information that we don't review, but I'll support Mr. Lubeck on it. That's fine. 
All right, it seems like we have support uh, from an informal poll. Um, we so have consensus. We have consensus. So can I get a motion that we table this to the March meeting? I make, I make a motion that we table the consideration for the, um, the zoning, 2023 zoning, zoning ordinance until the March 2nd meeting. We have motion. Do we have support? I'll support that. We have motion and support. Secretary, please call the roll. Ms. Moody? Yes. Mr. Lubeck? Yes. Mr. Lalonde? Yes. Mr. Brawl? Yes. Mr. Zulinski, yes. Chairman DeHunt? Yes. And can I make a request we get that revised or those revisions and that final copy that's intended to go to City Council? As soon as possible, so that we, there is adequate time to do a Mr. Brawl on them. Could we get it maybe like two weeks before the meeting? Not less than. Not less than two weeks before. In a nice spiral bound, so we can throw out the other ones and not look at bad ones. You know, the only thing, if it's in a spiral bound, my thought was to have the items redlined, and therefore it wouldn't be spiral bound. It's not a final copy. It'd be ideally it'd be a PDF but um, that we can review uh, with the red lines would pinpoint what are the changes and they can knock that out then we don't have to all search through our notes to see that would be my that would be what I would prefer our team is very efficient in summaries so they could probably do that for us all right is that enough time All right. I thought I'd ask. Moving on to the second hearing of the public. If anybody has anything to say, now is your time. You have three minutes. Say whatever you want. 30 seconds. <laughs> Gary Myron, East Point resident. Um, concern is a lot more rope lights are showing up. So I was just wondering if uh, somebody's looking at that. <laughs> And that's it just getting brighter and brighter at night thank you commissioner Ulinski is all over that does anyone else wish to be heard anyone else wish to be heard seeing none I will close the hearing of the public we'll move on to training I see none I'm good with that moving on to commissioners comments we will start in the very back with Mr. Seismansky. Oh, whatever. <laughs> Sorry. Forgive him, he's not Polish. Assistant City Manager. I think I've probably said enough tonight, but I, I do think that um, I want to commend the McKenna team um, and, and actually all of you for while well, Mr. Bolt had a chance to show how much work he put into it. I know all of the, all of you really do and read it word by word. So thanks to you as our commissioners for taking this so seriously and putting so much time into it. Um, and thank you to the McKenna team. Um, I think that the last meeting and this meeting were um, presentations for some of the best that we Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight and present the draft again. Ms. Brasiszewski. Thank you. Um, I just want to say thanks for the the interactive dialogue that we had dur er, earlier during our site plan and special land use reviews. I appreciated how we collaborated and discussed openly our, our thoughts and um, thank you for considering the planner's opinions. 
Um, I always appreciate your feedback, and thank you again, Commissioner Broll, for offering your feedback for the zoning ordinance. Mr. McCain. Sorry, I'm having issues with the bud. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, I'll I'll echo uh, everyone else's comments. Great job on the zoning ordinance, and I'll I'll echo my comments from last time and saying I'm excited to see the final version and uh, see it pass and go to city council. So, um, the other two things I wanted to mention, um, just since I, I have an opportunity to, is uh, we are in the process of uh, bringing on board a uh, community development fellow. So. Uh, applications are still out for that so if you know of any great candidates that want to uh, work with the city of East Point on community economic development projects through the next two years uh, definitely send them our way uh, the application is through CDAM's website so we work with them uh, through the interview and hiring process but uh, just wanted to share that as well as our upcoming uh, modern nine reconstruction launch and kickoff event on February 22nd from 1 to 4 p.m. it's gonna be here at City Hall uh, we'll have a small business resource fair um, at the beginning and the end of the event and then in the middle we'll be talking about the construction project so we'll have city administration planners engineers uh, providing updates timelines and things like that so um, and I want to clarify too that the event is specifically geared towards nine mile businesses but it's definitely you know open and welcome to the public and to other business owners throughout the city of East Point so if you're interested, if you're looking for um, more information about the construction project and or resources for your small business, come out and join us on the 22nd. Thank you. Mr. Albright. Thank you, uh, Mr. Or, uh, Mr. Chair. I'd like to once again commend uh, the kind of team. I think you guys have done a great job and uh, really put forth the team effort. I'd also like to recognize uh, this commission. I know Commissioner Lubeck can certainly appreciate this. It's been an interesting process seeing how the ordinance for the uh, medical marijuana uh, licenses uh, essentially started with this body making recommendations to the city council and all the time uh, that was spent by this body doing that and finally seeing the applicants come before the body for site plan uh, review and uh, special use approval and to see all that from start to finish is just really interesting i know that this this body has put in a lot of uh, a lot of time over the years not just months, but years in uh, making this happen. So I'd just like uh, to recognize that. Mr. Lalonde? I have no comment. Ms. Moody? I have no comment. It's a wonderful day today, and I will leave everyone with saying um, make every day count. Thank you. Ms. Ulinski? I have no comment. Thank you. Mr. Broll? It, yeah, it was nice to hear the first applicant say how our city is so buttoned up on the entire process that they've gone through. It speaks to both, you know, the, the, the commissions that we've had involved with it, but also McKenna and city administration. So it was really nice to hear that, you know, it, from many aspects. Uh, I'd also like to, and I've said this so many times regarding the zoning, the, the zoning um, documentation, like there's so much work that went into it. So thank you again to McKenna and the, the commissions and the city administration on that. It's really a, uh, it's a great document. Mr. Myron over there, I think you were just trying to wind up Sheila with that comment about rope lighting. You know that's her, her button, so. Um, I think that, that that's it, yeah, so thank you. Gary, I think you have to address Mr. Shemansky over there with that. Uh, I can't start my comments tonight without remembering a great loss that just took place in the city, the Honorable Carl Gerds III. I really got to know Carl many years ago when I served with him on the Zoning Board of Appeals. The Gerds family is an icon in this city. His father at one time was fire chief and his uncle was police chief. And those 10 years were at the same time. Carl served on city council, very active in the community, and taught a lot of us a lot of things. Uh, and he's going to be missed. Next, we're talking about murals. 
something that way back <clears throat> were absolutely not permitted in this city for whatever reason. But that's changed. It's going in a nice direction. And I'm thinking to something that I had took to the arts, what is it? ACDC, I can't think exactly what the acronym is, but the Arts and Diversity Group, BC. Not that I've been around that long, but I mean before COVID. And I'm going to bring it up tonight because it kind of fits in with a lot of things we're trying to do. Like it or not, depending on what your feelings of it are, I'm going to bring up Heidelberg in Detroit. I think almost everybody knows what Heidelberg is. And it got me to thinking, you can talk to people from out of the country that are aware, and there are people that have come here just to see Heidelberg. My thought with the Arts and Diversity Council was along Kelly Road, maybe coming up with a concept, an area like that, maybe call it art in the alleys. We have all these less than attractive brick walls and painted rear buildings. Imagine if we could get some people who are artists that would be willing to work with the businesses to put their murals on those ugly cement walls and on the backs of businesses there that you might actually have something where people are coming from out of the country to visit the nine mile area or I'm, or I'm sorry the Kelly Road area to look at the art it's just a thought but that might be a way to get us to turning Kelly Road into a kind of the visions that we've had of it before. And maybe with what's going to happen down at eight and Kelly would be a springboard for that. So I, you people want to think about it and see what would come up in those ideas. And then that also gave me a thought. We're talking about painting a wall in a new memorial garden. What if it was painted with a mural instead of just paint? really making that something, a drawing point. You know, if it's going to be a memorial garden, maybe have somebody recreate some of the more interesting photographs from past military engagements, representing the different branches of the military, representing the police and the fire, Coast Guard, and all those services. It's just a thought. And Mr. Albright brought up medical marijuana and all the work and time in that ordinance. I'm realizing we started working on that before my grandson was born. What stands out in my mind is the day my grandson was born. Everyone else was at the hospital rejoicing. I was sitting there at a joint meeting between Planning Commission and City Council. And that was four and a half years ago. There's a timeline for you on that. Other than that, uh, I'm done with my comments. You said joint. I said mud in the tires, too. But I didn't say utes. I was just going to say that. <laughs> um, to piggyback off something that uh, Commissioner Lubeck said about the murals, please do some due diligence and look at Portsmouth, Ohio. I travel there for work, and they literally have a, I don't want to say a monument, but they have a visit. Along the Ohio River, you have all these uh, masonry walls or whatever, for lack of, and there are murals along the whole side of them, going a, a long length. And people will go, and, and it's got a lovely green space too, people will go just to see the murals. So, you're spot on there. That would be absolutely wonderful. Um, I, too, want to um, pay homage to Judge Gerds. He was a good man from a good family and did a lot for this community. 
also want to put a little good uh, prayer and karma out for Ms. Naylor's family. They suffered a loss, and that's why Ms. Naylor's not here, so we need to put a little good energy out for her. Um, timing. Timing is very precious to people that are busy. Please make sure we have all the documentation that we need and that the city needs in a timely fashion. Uh, whether it is the zoning changes in two weeks or documents that, that are needed for public hearings or whatever, it is critical that we have that information early because I'm going to keep squeezing them so we can get packets sooner than Friday before the meeting. They're going to hate me for it, but it wouldn't be nice to have all of our information buttoned down and in our hands. So. I, I encourage everybody to do that because time is precious. Um, we all work, most, I believe we all work. Uh, no, you work, Leo. You're Joyce's husband. Uh, but <laughs> for the most part, we all work and timing is precious. And, you know, I also have to give congrats, uh, thanks to Mr. Brawl because we do value your unique insight. There are things that I didn't see that you saw. And I'm still irritated about that obscene line. Um, but I, I, I just went right past it until you had said something. So we all have a unique opinion. We all have a unique way of, of doing these things. And you can never have another day off when we're having that type of meeting. Otherwise, everything's good. Thank you, everybody. You need a motion? I'm, I'm getting there. <laughs> can I get a motion? <laughs> To close the meeting. I'll support Leo's motion. <laughs> we have motion and support. Secretary, please call the roll. In a hurry, Leo. <laughs> you wanted a hard stop at nine o'clock. Everyone told me we were two minutes early. Mr. Lilland? Yes. Mr. Lubeck? Yes. Mr. Brawl? Yes. Ms. Moody? Yes. Ms. Ulinski? Yes. Chairman DeHunt? Yes. Nine o'clock.